The film really brought up a lot of emotion for me. It got to me a couple of times, very deeply and very profoundly, because uh, this thing hasn't ended uh, for me. Um, even though I'm 71 years old, um, and this happened, you know, many, many years ago, 1964, I still live with that all the time. I still have feelings about my father. I still feel his presence around me. I feel him guiding me uh, in many ways. So um, watching, uh, watching Patrick play me on the, uh, in the film was, a, was, a, uh, it was a very emotional experience for me, uh, every bit of it. I, it took me a while to get accustomed to it being contemporary times. Um, and to watch w what a jerk he was uh, <laughs> with his family. Uh, I don't think I was quite as, uh, you know, as crass and, uh, and insensitive uh, as he was, but I was, uh, in, in, especially in that relationship uh, with his son. Uh, at that time, I had a daughter, you know, only one daughter. I now have six daughters and two sons. <laughs> um, so it was, um, you know, but, but, but the essential uh, essence of, uh, of a man who was troubled and um, uh, compelled to, uh, to find this, um, this man and to understand. See, as, as a young boy, um, I could just never understand how someone could just walk away, you know, just, just leave. And while my two brothers didn't take it personally, I think it might have been because they were just a bit older than I was. Um, but for me, it was like I just couldn't grasp the idea of, of, of someone leaving. Uh, and I think Patrick really, in the movie, I think he really was able to, to show that, that, uh, that it was, he, he was tormented um, but by this idea of, uh, of someone just walking away. And, you know, and it wasn't so much that uh, he had walked away from me, it was that he had walked away from my mother uh, and my two brothers. It used to bother me more than me, but I was fine. I mean, I just, I just grew up in foster homes and, and orphanages and so on, and that was, um, to me, that was just life. The story of my relationship to my father is really the story of my life, and this is a man that I, I have absolutely no memory of. Um, he left when I was very, very young, under two, maybe even under one. I, I'm, I'm, I can never get the facts straight on it. The first um, eight or nine years of my life, I lived with my brother David, uh, and wherever home, whatever home we went to, um, we went together. Uh, my mother placed my oldest brother, Jim, with my grandparents uh, after my father left, and Dave and I. Uh, traveled through various kinds of, of homes and, and, and experiences, some of which were terrible, and some, and, but most of which were just living in large homes with lots of kids who were in similar situations. I didn't, I didn't know what the concept of father was. Uh, and, and that's probably a hard thing for, for people watching this to understand because most people have an idea of you know, what a father is. Um, but I didn't, the, the word didn't even mean anything to me. I didn't, I didn't even know that, that kids had fathers. Um, uh, it was just, um, you know, we, uh, I had a mother, and my mother would try to visit us on occasion whenever she could, but she didn't have very many means to do that. Um, but the idea of, 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 of a father didn't really hit me until I was probably nine or ten years old, until I moved back in with my mom. Uh, and she married uh, my, st my stepfather, who was a, very ma a, sam a man very similar to my own father, an alcoholic, uh, abusive man, um, uh, not ready to take on the responsibility of raising three young boys that were 10, 12, and 14. And he, uh, ultimately, he left as well. And I can remember my relationship to that man being one of riding around on my bicycle around the block waiting for him to uh, waiting for his car to leave because he was always drunk and, uh, and having to deal with uh, uh, j just the way that he treated myself and my brothers and my mother and so on it was just not not 
you know, the idea of father wasn't a good, <laughs> a good concept for me as I was, as I was growing up. But um, there was something inside of me that um, uh, was very different than my other two brothers. I really wanted to know. I wanted to know who this man was. I wanted to know what he was like. And, um, and I started having dreams when I was uh, maybe 10, 11, 12 years of age. Um, and I would um, want to know, you know, I, I, I would dream about meeting him and, and finding out who he was. And, and to move forward on that, it was when I was about, when I was, I think I was 15, I think it was 1955. And um, we got a telephone call that um, his mother, my grandmother, whom I had never met, I had no awareness of, she lived in the same city on a different different part of the town. She lived on the west side of Detroit. I lived on the east side. And they had told me that um, uh, that she had died. And I was asked to be a Paul Bear along with my two brothers. Um, I don't think they went. I don't remember this too well, but I do remember being there. And I remember the reason why I said I would go. And the reason I said I would go is because I was sure that um, my father would, would be there. And this was going to be my very first chance to see them, and I to see him, and I was very, very excited about this as a 15-year-old boy in the 10th grade. And my mother at that time had just gone through this uh, divorce situation with my stepfather, so he was finally out of the house, and having him out of the house was like having a terrorist move out of the house. I mean, it was just, you know, we could relax, we could be at peace, we didn't have to, sitting around at the table, we didn't have to be yelled at, we didn't have to have somebody smacking us, we didn't have, I mean, it was just, uh, just a whole different, a whole different world. Um, so I went, I went to this house on the other side of uh, Detroit, um, and I went to the funeral, and I carried the casket of my grandmother, whom I didn't even know, didn't even know her name, um, and a, uh, a note arrived, um, a, a telegram, saying that uh, he, he, he wasn't going to show up, and uh, uh, I think he sent flowers, but I'm not even certain of that, um, but he just said he couldn't go. He was down south someplace, down in, uh, I think it was in Mississippi or Alabama or someplace with uh, his fourth or fifth wife, and that uh, he wasn't able to make it. Now, my mother said that he wouldn't come, for sure, because she would have thrown him in jail. He had already spent quite a bit of time in jail himself um, for stealing and things like that. And, uh, uh, but he, uh, she, and, and he, had, he owed her so much money in child support and, and, and payments and things and, uh, and money that he had stolen from her and so on. And that he, uh, she said, she, and she was, she was still bitter, very, very angry. She still is, even to this day. She's 95 years old at this, as we're filming this right now. And she still has very deep, strong resentments towards him and doesn't, uh, doesn't feel the way I do about the, the whole situation. But I understand that. But she would have thrown him back in jail in a minute, you know, to, to, uh, just to get even with him for so many of the horrible things that he did. And it's, there, it's too long a list to go through them. So um, I left there and thought, well, I wasn't going to meet my father. And then through the years, 16, 17, 18, until I graduated from a high school, um, I went on a search for my father. I really wanted to meet this man. Um, and uh, everywhere I went, I, I ran into a dead end. And everywhere I went, the, the same thing would happen. He had a, a couple of additional wives. One of them was from a place called Blooming Rose, West Virginia, or someplace like that. And uh, he had married some young teenage girl down there. And, uh, um, I was, uh, I, it just, I would get to just a place where I'd get close to, to finding him, and he'd be gone. I went to a place called Sandusky, Ohio, um, where uh, one of his ex-wives was a nurse. And um, I met her and, um, and spent an afternoon with her and uh, wanted to find out. I really wanted to find out if there was anything good about him, you know, because uh, everything I'd ever heard about him from from my oldest brother to uh, my mother and, and anyone else, uh, my grandparents, they all said the same thing, uh, that this guy was just, just a bad dude. And, uh, you know, and I met this lady and, and I told her what my mother had said and she said, your mother is right, uh, this guy's an asshole. <laughs> that was her, that was her word. And so 
uh, I went. In, I graduated from high school, 18, went into the service. I spent four years uh, in the Navy, overseas, mostly over in the, in, in the Far East and on Guam and so on. And when I got out, um, it was uh, 1962. And then um, I finished my, my studies in 1970. Uh, I was 30 years old. I was six days before my, uh, my 30th birthday. It was May the 4th, 1970. It was the same day as Kent State. I'll never forget it. That's the day I took my doctoral orals. And the truth of it is, at that time, my, my life was somewhat out of control. Um, I was drinking. Um, I was overweight. Uh, I was eating terrible food. And this is when the dreams got really intense. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, I, I would wake up just being... I'd, I'd be in a sweat, I'd be in a cold sweat, and just, I'd, I'd be fighting with him and hitting him. And, and actually, in the, in the film, they show him in a bar, and um, that was what my dream always was, that I would run into a bar, and I'd, I'd, I'd just start talking to him and so on. And then, in, I, I was teaching there at the university, in, at St. John's University in New York, which is portrayed in the film as well. Um, I got a phone call. I'm not sure when, so the, the time thing on this is always very confusing to me um, because it just seems like my whole life I, I spent just searching for this man, trying to find, find out who this guy was. Um, and, and I just really always wanted an answer to the question, um, how could you leave? How could you just walk away? You know, in the film, um, they show my, my two brothers and I playing ball and that, that, that's actually a, a true story that was a, that was something that my brother Jim told me uh, actually happened you know that he uh, had seen my father uh, in a car looking at us and and all three of us were there uh, and he just drove away and my brother even had told me about it you know that that, that was your father um, it was the only time that I had ever even known that he was even close to me. So it was, um, so I taught at the university and so on, and, uh, and then I got a phone call one day from uh, my cousin. Her name was Dorothy Phillips. Again, a cousin I didn't know. She was a cousin from his side of the family, so I had absolutely no contact with that side of the family at all. She heard that I was always looking for my father and that um, it was like, like a, a passion of mine, that I wanted to find him. Whereas my mother didn't want anything to do about him, didn't want to even talk about him. My other two brothers, they couldn't care less. They didn't have it, it didn't mean anything to them. Um, and she said, um, I, she said, I don't know how to tell you this. She said, but your father is dead. And she said, he, um, he died uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and he was buried in a uh, in a pauper's grave someplace down in the south, someplace. So she said, "All I know is that he was uh, he was in New Orleans, and that um, and they shipped his body someplace, but I'm not sure where." And that's all the information she gave, and all the information that she would give me. And so I called the infirmary down in uh, in New Orleans, where she said she thought he was buried, and found out gave his name, Melvin Lyle Dyer, uh, the year that he was born, 1914. Um, and, uh, and, and they told me that the only record they have of him is that he was there, that he died of uh, cirrhosis of the liver, that he was an alcoholic and, and, and really, really in a bad way, and that his um, body had been shipped to uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, which is the last place that he had worked, and that uh, they didn't even know any more about him than that. This was in August of 1974, and I was teaching at St. John's University. Um, it was uh, there was a, there was a, t a professor there. Her name was Shirley Griggs, and she was the um, coordinator for this uh, program to. Uh, investigate whether the laws that had been passed during the, the Lyndon Johnson administration um, were being enforced, the civil rights laws, the civil rights acts that had, had been were being enforced, particularly in places in the South, 
uh, in the segregated schools of the South and were they beginning to integrate and they wanted to know if um, if I would uh, go down to this s a school in um, Mississippi, the Mississippi State College for Women, I think is what it was called. Um, and it was in a place called Columbus, Mississippi. And, um, and Shirley asked me, she said, uh, and this was just weeks or days after I had found out that my father had, was dead um, and that he was buried someplace in Mississippi, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I had found out that it was in Biloxi. So um, I, took a, uh, I took this assignment and uh, you know, it was like they were going to pay me to go down there, to go incognito. Um, I, I uh, f <coughs> got to Columbus, Mississippi um, and did my work, whatever it was I was to do. I've, I went into some of the classrooms, I took notes, and I, I interviewed some of the faculty members and some of the students and filled out the forms and, and sent it in, and that was my job uh, for, for, that, uh, for that weekend. And then uh, it was on a Friday, I think it was, it was either the 24th or the 27th of August, uh, in, in there somewhere. And um, it was 1974, and I it was determined that I was going to go to Biloxi, and I was going to find I was going to find out about my father. I was going to find out if he was buried there. I was going to find out if he, if there was anybody there that he um, you know that he knew that he had worked with. Did he have any friends there? Whatever. Um, this this mystery that was just something that had plagued me from the time that I was a little boy. Uh, it just never seemed to have an end. So Biloxi is uh, about 200 miles from, uh, from Columbus. Um, so I went into this rental car place, and um, there was a, one car there, and it was a, a, a Dodge. It was a 1974 Dodge Coronet Blue. And this is very vivid to me. Um, and uh, it had a bench seat. It had... Um, in those days, they didn't have shoulder shoulder uh, restraints. They only had seat, uh, you know, belt buckle, you know. But uh, and I had already become accustomed to wearing one, so it was just, um, you know, just something that I always did. You put your seat belt on. Uh, and I, I got into this car, and it was this car with this, it had that new car smell. And I looked on the odometer, and nobody had ever driven this car before. There was like nine-tenths of a mile on it. The car had been dropped off there that, that, that afternoon. Um, it was an Avis uh, rental car place. <laughs> and uh, I got into the car, and I got a little map to go down to Biloxi. It was a four-hour drive. It was about one o'clock in the afternoon, maybe, maybe noon, something like that. I was all finished with my work. It was on a Friday. And I got the left, pulled out the, out here, uh, the buckle, and I reached down for the buckle, the actual buckle part. And there's no buckle. There's only the strap and no buckle. And it's like there's no way to put it in. And I thought, what is this? How could this possibly be? You know? And uh, I looked around and I reached down underneath and there was nothing there. So there's something in me that when those things happen, I have to get it resolved. I wasn't going to drive all the way down there without a seatbelt on. So I... Um, got out of the car, and I took the entire front seat belt, or some front seat, out, and I put it down on the tarmac on the ground there, and I looked at the, at the floorboard of the car, and there was the, the buckle um, wrapped up in plastic with a rubber band around it and masking tape. It was masking taped to the uh, floorboard of the car. And I think it was done because they didn't want the, bu the buckle to cut the upholstery. That, that was my guess. And they, they had done that in the factory, but when they delivered the car, they were supposed to, you know, take that out and make the seat belt available, but uh, it wasn't. So I took the rubber band off. I, first I took the tape off, then I took the rubber band off, and then I took the plastic that had been covering the buckle out, and I picked the whole thing up, set it up like this, went in, got the seat, put the seat back in, adjusted it, and reached down for the buckle and put the buckle over my, uh, over my lap. And I opened up the buckle, and there was a business card inside of the buckle. Business card said, uh, Candlelight Inn, Biloxi, Mississippi. 
And on the back of the card, there was an embossed map about how to get to this little inn. That was the, the business card for this, this place. And honestly, at the, at the very moment that that happened, I didn't really think too much about it other than, well, that's kind of weird. It's kind of this brand new car, and it's like, and I'm going to Biloxi. Um, and I put it in this pocket up here, all right? When these kinds of things happen in our lives, these um, weird coincidences, these, um, you know, I've, I've often said in my lectures that the word coincidence comes from coincide in mathematics. Uh, when, we t when you took geometry, uh, you learned that two angles that coincide are two angles that fit together perfectly. That's, you know, and we've taken a term that means something that fits together perfectly and interpreted it to mean uh, something that shows up accidentally. It's just a coincidence. When in fact, coincidence is perfect alignment. So, but you often don't realize these because I, this isn't the only experience I've had like this in my life. Um, I can now look back from this age that I am now at many of the things that have shown up in my life and see how they've impacted my life from, from a distance. You know, that song that Bette Midler sings, From a Distance, if you can get back far enough, you can, um, you can begin to see how so many of the things uh, that showed up fit together in sort of a, a tapestry of, to, to form uh, your life, if you will. So anyway, I put that business card in my, in my, up my shirt sleeve pocket, um, and I drove down to Biloxi. I, I picked up a man uh, hitchhiking uh, on the way down there, a black man from uh, Mississippi, and I was the he told me I was the first white man uh, that he had ever talked to uh, in person, you know, face to face. And he couldn't even look me in the, in the face. He would always look down. And I remember talking to him, and I went 40 miles out of my way uh, to drive him to where he lived. He lived in this real rural shack area someplace in southern Mississippi. And, um, and then I got back on the road, and I, I went down. To, I got to... Uh, and my heart was starting to beat faster. I was, I was getting excited because I really sensed something inside of me that I was, uh, that this was, a, that this, this was a very significant trip. It, it wasn't this little job I had for the federal government, you know, looking at the, whether the civil rights laws were being enforced. This was about, um, this was about the purpose of my life, and I sensed that. I mean that. that uh, but I didn't know I didn't know too much about it, and and this was my own journey. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my brothers about this. I didn't I didn't tell I didn't tell my wife about it uh, when I when I went down there. I just uh, I didn't tell my daughter. I didn't tell anyone. It was just my own little private journey. So I get to Biloxi, Mississippi. There's a sign that says "Welcome to Biloxi." There was a gas station about uh, I think it was a standard gas station, uh, and it was maybe a hundred yards past that welcome to Biloxi sign and I pulled into that gas station and <clears throat> and there was a, f a phone book that was hanging down on a chain um, and I took the phone book out and looked up uh, cemeteries uh, in, in the yellow pages of the back of this little the phone directory and there were three listings for the cemeteries there were two that were br broader print, and I called the first one, and there was no answer. It was 10 minutes to 5. It was a Friday afternoon in late August. Um, I called the second one, and it, and it was busy. Busy, 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 busy. Couldn't get any answer. Because I remember I had, to put a di I had to put a dime, you know, so you could tell when this was. <laughs> I put a dime in the phone, and each time the dime would come, it was the only dime I had. So I was really afraid that I was going to lose it, uh, you know, and, uh, and a dime at that time was equivalent to about $150 today. <laughs> so, um, so the third one was a real small listing uh, under cemeteries, um, very, very faint, um, much less uh, prominent than the other two. So I said, uh, I'll just call it anyway. So I did. I, I called the number and it rang and rang and rang and rang and rang and rang and finally this old man's voice came on and uh, deep southern drawl and uh, I said, uh, I gave him my name, I said my name is Wayne Dyer and um, I'm uh, coming to Biloxi and I'm trying to find out if uh, my father could possibly be buried 
uh, at your uh, at your cemetery. And he said, well, he said, first of all, this isn't a cemetery. He said, but it's a place where some people are buried. He said, but uh, what was his name? He said, we, I can look it up. So I gave him his name, Melvin Lyle Dyer. I gave him uh, when he was born. I uh, was born on Halloween uh, in 1914. Uh, and um, <laughs> he was gone for the longest time. And then he came back. It seemed like it seemed like ten or fifteen minutes. It was probably three or four. But uh, uh, he came back and he said, "Yes." He said, uh, "Your father, um, your father died in New Orleans. His body was shipped up here uh, in 1964." And he said, uh, "Yes, he's buried here." He said, "But this isn't a cemetery." I said, um, "Well, could I come there?" I said, "And could I see the death certificate?" And he said, "Yes, you could do that." He said. Um, I said, well, how do I get there? Just tell me where it is. He said, um, well, your father is, is buried in a, uh, a place where they buried indigents, and, it's, uh, uh, and it's, on the, it's on the property of the Candlelight Inn here in Biloxi. <laughs> and I reached into my pocket, and I said, um, the Candlelight Inn? And he said, yeah. He said, I can tell you how to get there, and I turned the cart over. And I said, I, I've got a map. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, I've got a map. I'll be there. Well, Biloxi is very small. I was there in three minutes. You know, um, I just drove up the road, drove in, and I went to this little, it's like a little hut, like a little white hut with a thatch roof on it. And I walked in there, and I said, um, could I see the death? And the only thing I really wanted to see on the death certificate is if my name was on it. You know, they... Um, they put, uh, you know, the <coughs> relatives on there, you know, when, and whether there's any children or not. And he reached, <laughs> he, the, the records that they kept in southern Mississippi, it was a Coca-Cola box, a cardboard Coca-Cola box with, with water stains all over it. And this is where they kept all of the p records of the people who had d died and, and, and been buried there. And he had gone back to 1964. This was 10 years back. And he had pulled out this water-stained death certificate that said that he had what he had died of uh, and that um, uh, and that he had three sons uh, Jim David and Wayne and my name was on there which really surprised me and I asked the man I said uh, um, do you know anything about him and he said the only thing I know is that he worked at the uh, movie theater uh, and the movie theater um, uh, is down in downtown uh, Biloxi. And, uh, and he said there's a fellow there that was his best friend, who was a projectionist as well. They were drinking buddies. He said, um, you know, you might want to go and talk to him. Uh, and I said, well, before that, I said, I'd really like to go to his grave because I had something in mind that I wanted to do on his grave. <laughs> I was full of rage <laughs> and anger. And I was literally going to piss on his grave. I mean, uh, uh, j just um, tell this man how, uh, and show this man, you know, how, how I felt about him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing how, how uh, that still hangs with me, even today. And um, I, uh, he told me, he said, um, it's 5 o'clock. He said, um, when you go to the grave, uh, he said, there's a chain that goes across the fence. He said, just um, when you leave, he said, just, uh, he said, just put the chain back up, you know. And I remember making some silly comment, like, I don't think anybody's going to worry about getting out of there. You know, they're all buried or something. And I made a... And I walked over to his... Um, I found his gravesite. It was just a little plaque in the ground. It said, Melvin Lyle Dyer, 1914, 1964. Well, he was 49 years old when he passed away. And... Um, and I stood on his grave, and I was there till, it was in August, uh, I th 
you know, time just, uh, it's, it's really, I, I don't know how long I was there. I was there till it was almost dark. So probably two or three hours, um, probably seven, seven thirty, eight o'clock. And I just walked and I talked and I had this long conversation with him about how, uh, how asking questions like, how could you do this? How could you, how could you walk out on a woman as beautiful as, as, as my mother and just, um, and just leave her? And, and how could you leave your kids? And how could you not just pick up the telephone once and call or send a letter or anything? I guess I just couldn't figure out how someone could could, could do that. Uh, I was a father myself. Um, I had already been. Uh, it's 1974. Yeah, I was just 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 gotten uh, gotten divorced. Um, my daughter was seven years old at that time. She was born in '67. So. Uh, but I, I, even getting divorced, I mean, I mean, she was just, you know, I, was, I saw her every every weekend as possible that I could, and she spent, you know, I moved down to, I moved down, to, I moved to New York, and I would fly back and forth. I would do these long drives because it's just so important to just see her, just to be with her, you know, and um, and he just. Uh, so anyway, the anger, I don't, I don't know, I just, I remember pacing, I remember sitting there, I remember crying, I remember the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the emotion of it. And, and I, I just couldn't leave because uh, every time I'd get up to go to leave um, and, and go back to the car, I would, uh, I'd come back, I was drawn back, I was like a magnet, it would just kept drawing me back. So finally it was... I, I'd say maybe close to eight o'clock, and um, I uh, I just was saying goodbye, and all of a sudden something came over me. It's like I can't, I can never explain this except that it was probably the signal of, of, of event of my life. Um, I just felt this incredible sense of warmth um, and kindness. And um, and sadness, uh, and uh, I want to say joy, but it wasn't joy. But I just, it, it, I just, everything shifted. And I, um, I, I said to him, I said, from this, I, I, I don't, I, I've never forgotten this because I, I said, from this moment on, I send you love. And I, um, I have uh, no right to, to judge you any any longer, and um, I'm just going to send you love f from now on. I'm, I didn't think of the word forgiveness. It wasn't like I, uh, you know, like it was up to me to forgive him. It was just uh, I am going to replace this rage, this anger, this hatred, this. The, dr the dreams, I mean, at that time, my dreams were so strong that I would wake up just soaking wet, like the sheets and, you know, uh, would, would just be, I'd have to actually change the sheets because I would be so, so enraged and I'd, I'd be hitting him and fighting him and just, you know, we would go through these this violent, like, how could you, how dare you, and I would grab him and it's just like, a, and um, I just wanted to just know who you are and it's like, how could, how do you? How could you have such insensitivity to uh, to other human beings? I just d d didn't. I just didn't understand it. Um, and I walked away from there like a changed man. I got back in the car. Um, I drove, got out of the car, put the chain up across the driveway there that uh, went in there, and. Um, Drove to uh, drove down to New Orleans, dropped the car off in New Orleans, and um, flew back home to uh, New York. And the semester was going to start um, right after Labor Day, about somewhere around the 10th, 12th of September. So I had like two and a half, three weeks to um, you know before the semester was to start. It was sort of vacation time. I was all done with my work. I filed my report. And I, uh, 
I took all the notes that I had from the previous couple of years of lectures that I had been giving at the university on guilt and on worry because I was teaching people to become therapists and uh, doctoral students and so on. And um, I said, uh, I took all of my notes. I told my wife, I said, I'm going down to uh, Fort Lauderdale. And I uh, checked into a motel down there in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale. And I wrote, uh, I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote <coughs> by hand um, a book that became Your Erroneous Zones, which um, became like this worldwide phenomenon later. And it's like I just wrote it as it came out. Um, today there's 50 or 60 million copies of that book in print and I think 47 languages now. It's like just last year it was the number one book in Korea. I mean, that, this many years later, I mean, it's all over the world. The things have been translated and so on. But it wasn't just that the, my writing changed when I got that anger and that hatred and the bitterness and the rage out of me. Everything about my life changed after that. Um, I. My wife and I separated. Um, I started eating differently. Um, um, I stopped drinking. I started running, uh, getting myself back into shape again. Um, I moved uh, out of New York, uh, moved down to Florida, um, started becoming an international celebrity doing, you know, the Johnny Carson show every three weeks and so on. I mean, it's like everything about my life changed. My, my, uh, I started to have a reason to live again. I stopped. Uh, I stopped all the punishing things that I, you know, that I was doing before that. The, the kinds of things like eating like greasy foods and, uh, you know, and just getting fat and. Um, um, and I, I took on a totally different attitude. When I went back to the university, my, I remember the people that I worked with at the university just said, there's something different about you. My, my classes, I had more joy. I, had, uh, I became funny again. And, uh, and uh, so many things changed. And it was, uh, you know, at the, in the film, there's a, you open that with that line from, uh, from Mark Twain, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. And I realized that I had I had really finally forgiven my father and um, and taken the uh, you know the the hatred and the and the rage and so on and and just converted it to love. And later on in my life, one of the most significant people coming into my life was uh, was Saint Francis. Um, and Saint Francis's prayer is you know make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. And that hung on my, uh, you know, I, I met my, <coughs> I met my uh, wife, whom we had seven more children with, and uh, uh, so many things changed about that. But that, th those words, where there is hatred, let me bring love, the opening lines of, of the prayer of St. Francis. Um, I wrote an entire book based on that prayer years later. There's a spiritual solution to every problem. I've been to Assisi three times in my life and lectured there and I've, li I've literally felt him entering my body, the, his, his presence with me. And it's again, it's one of those, you look back like the business card showing up in there. I also look back at somebody handed me that prayer at a, at a uh, lecture that I gave in the early 80s and I, I didn't know much about St. Francis. I didn't even know the city of San Francisco was named after St. Francis. I had never made, made the connection. And I wasn't raised Catholic. I was where, whatever home I lived in, that's the religion I was. You know, if we were lived in a Baptist home, you were Baptist. If you lived in a Jewish home, you went to a synagogue. It was just the way it was, you know. And it was like that theme of being able to bring love to the presence of hatred and not just, uh, <clears throat> not just turn it around, but to convert it, you know, to convert hatred into love which is what an alchemist is, you know, someone who, who uh, uh, practices alchemy. It's like you turn lead into gold, you turn hatred into, you turn uh, sadness into joy, you turn darkness into light, um, that it's there. And I turned rage into love. 
And the truth of it is today, um, all these years later, I feel, I feel that he was, he was the greatest teacher of my life. And that somehow, whatever it is that is orchestrating the, this universe and um, moving the pieces around to make things happen in our lives, this source, I could, you call it God, or I've written a book on the Tao, um, change your thoughts, change your life, and it's about the Tao Te Ching. And the Tao is just another name for God, you know, whether you call it God or Tao or Allah or Krishna, uh, it makes no difference what you call it. Um, it's really about this concept of, of knowing that um, all of these things that happen in our lives uh, are happening to, you know, to bring us to a higher place. And who are any of us to say? It's like, I often think that my father, uh, you know, may, may have incarnated into this world. It might have been the, the plan of the greater source to incarnate into this world, <coughs> to have three sons, and to have one, one of those sons be so internally passionate about knowing who he was, and to leave, and to make him chase after that, and to fill him with rage. Um, so that he could uh, ultimately get to a place where he could forgive and in doing so teach millions and millions of people about the importance of having love in your heart instead of hatred which is exactly what has happened and if that's what has happened why is it such a mystery for us to think that maybe it was all orchestrated maybe it was all part of the perfection of all of it and how do you explain that, that business card? I mean, you can't explain that business card showing up in a car that had never been driven before in a buckle. Um, but yet, you know, if you interview enough people and you ask them about some of the bizarre things that have happened in their life and you dig deep enough, you'll find that there's, there's something mysterious about all of the things that led us how you met the person that you love, you know, how, how, how that person happened to show up. If you would have turned left instead of right at that particular moment, then it, your life would have gone a, There was a movie one time made called Sliding Doors. I don't know if you've uh, have ever seen that. And it's like Gwyneth Paltrow. And if you take this door, you know, this, your whole life goes this way and come back. And then they show if you would have taken this door and slid it this way, your whole life would have gone another way. And all of these things, are, there, there's an intelligence. I mean, we're sitting here now, and this intelligence is beating my heart and growing our hair and making our, uh, you know, our bodies function. We, have, we don't even know how any of this works. We have no idea. It's like living in this great mystery. And, um, and instead of trying to figure it all out scientifically and say, well, how that card got in there, you know, in some... It has nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with figuring it out intellectually. It's understanding that uh, we're all spiritual beings in a, in a spiritual world. And, um, you know, as Jesus put it, uh, it's the spirit that gives life. You know, if something called spirit can take uh, nothingness and bring from nothingness somethingness, bring form out of nothingness, then it can certainly put a business card in a, uh, that's like, a, a, that's a minor little thing to happen. And so I'm open to the possibility that all of that happened. And now, very often when I'm on stage, and uh, if I get stuck for a moment, if I'm not sure what to say, or um, I just, I feel the presence of my father. And I've had people who read auras and, and claim to be able to see these things have said, uh, they've even, even on pictures now, orbs show up on pictures. Uh, and, and people have looked inside and, and seen, uh, and I've seen a picture now of my father for the first time. Uh, I, have, I have it at home. Photograph. A photograph, yeah, that my oldest brother had. Um, and there have been people that I've met in my life who remind me so much of him that it's like, um, when I, this one woman that I knew, um, whenever I would look at her, I would always think of my father. And she, the interesting thing about it is she was from New Orleans. And, uh, and she had a, um, uh, they had a condominium that they summered in every uh, year in Biloxi, right across the street from, and she was born in, uh, right about the same time that I went there for the, forget, 1975. 
I mean, there's such a connection. She's been to his grave two or three times. And every time I would look at her or see her or have anything to do with her, I would always re remind her of my father. It was almost like it was, it was a, a jolt. Who knows? We, none of us know. It's just, I guess it's the whole idea that uh, these are all mysteries. It's, this is all magic, real magic. Well, I always say to my kids, when they give me a hard time about doing something wrong or I should have done it this way, well, I says, look, I, I didn't have any preparation for this. I just, uh, man, I'm just, I'm flying by the, you know, uh, you know, by the seat of my pants. Uh, I've never had any training. I don't know what fathers do. Uh, I'm just doing the best I can. And I think, I, I mean, I have eight children and, um, and my wife and I have been separated for almost 11 years, um, uh, so, but I spend a, a lot of time with my children. They come to where I, I live in Hawaii, uh, they come to visit me a lot and vice versa. The thing I guess I'm most proud of in my life is really my relationship to my children uh, and my relationship to my wife, um, who I've been separated from, but we love each other, we talk to each other almost every day, we care deeply about each other. Um, we just have sort of gone in different directions, um, but we never we never divorced our children, um, and we didn't we didn't put much energy into putting the other person down. Maybe at the very beginning, but then we st we softened and stopped on that, all of that. And um, every single one of my my children um, are are. are uh, human beings that I can, that I know are going to make this world a better place. They're they're. They're kind, they're soft, they're gentle, they're, um, they're compassionate. They've been raised in, a, in an atmosphere of, um, of kindness and peace and joy. I mean, we, we, we taught them to meditate when they were just very, very young. And when there was a sign on the door that said, Mom is meditating, they knew that that was sacred time. And so my kids have, have great respect for that. And, the, and they're constantly reaching out to, uh, you know, to, to help other people. I've had a very strong sense of what my purpose is, particularly since um, since this experience of, uh, of forgiveness with my father, and have uh, have never apologized for that. I mean, uh, I'm a writer and a speaker, and I go out and I, and I have a, um, I have a very uh, very strong sense of my responsibility to teach the messages that I feel inside, and forgiveness is one of them. Um, because I think forgiveness is really at the core of, um, you know, in The Course in Miracles it says, in order to forgive you must have blamed. And if you don't blame, if you don't put your, uh, if, you don't, if, you, if you don't blame other people for why you are the way you are, then there's nothing to forgive. So if, if we can just learn to not blame. And I think that's what happened for me at my father's grave. It wasn't so much that I learned to, uh, that I forgave him, as it was that I stopped blaming him. Um, and I started seeing inside, like in the film, uh, Patrick says something to the effect of, uh, uh, um, who, who am I? to be uh, judging you for what, uh, for what you did. You did the best you can, or something like that, he says in the film. Um, and that's, that's very much the truth of it, for, that all of us, all of us are just doing the best that we can, that we, um, you know, in, in that particular moment. Um, and we grow from it. And, uh, and I've taught my children uh, this, this as well. Do the best that you can in there, and if the best that you can is something that you want to improve upon, then improve upon it. Um, so as a, as a father, um, my, I think my greatest gift that I have given my children is that they know that I am a person who's out there doing what he came here to do, and that my whole life isn't about serving them. My, they will learn how to be self-actualized, fully functioning, happy, contented, enlightened human beings if they're around and surrounded by someone who's doing the same, who's living, living their own dharma, who's out there making the difference. And sometimes that means being gone. And sometimes it means that I can't always be there for dinner and do all the things and be at every game and at everything. But if, uh, 
if I stop writing and if I stop speaking and if I stop doing the things that I know are what I came into this world to do, um, then I'm just going to be a very discontented person and, it's, and, and, and it'll kill me. I mean, when people ask me, why do you keep speaking and why do you keep writing and all that, I, say, I always say, if I, if I didn't do it, I think I would just die. I think it would be, it would be the end of me. So my purpose here isn't to, just to be a father. My purpose is to fulfill my destiny and help give and provide a model for my children of someone who's doing that and is still loving you uh, and encouraging you to do the same. Um, because I've, I've always been what uh, I've said it many times in, in my talks, I call it uh, being a scurvy elephant. When I was in the third grade, uh, living out in a foster home in Mount Clemens, Michigan, I came home from school and, and said to Mrs. Scarf, what's, what's a scurvy elephant? And she said, what? Where did you hear that? And I said, well, I heard Mrs. Poole, who was my third grade teacher, talking to Mrs. Smith, who was the principal after class, that Wayne Dyer was in her classroom and that he was a scurvy elephant. And so she called the principal and the principal said, oh, that, that's Wayne Dyer. You know, he just gets everything mixed up. She didn't say he was a scurvy elephant in her classroom. She said that he was a disturbing element in her classroom. <laughs> and um, I've told that story so many times, but the, uh, the, you know, people send me little scurvy elephants from all over the world, these crazy, weird looking elephants and all of that. But there's an, it's, it's a reminder that, um, you know, you have to, you have to, we all have a calling, and, 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 and I respect that in every one of my kids. Every one, each one of my eight children has, has, has their own calling. They're here to do and fulfill uh, something that, uh, you know, that I strongly believe in. The, the great poet uh, Khalil Gibran and, and the prophet said, your children are not your children. Uh, they are the products of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not for you. And I just don't believe my children came here for me, that I own them, that, I, that they have a responsibility to me to please me. When they wanted to do things that I didn't do, when they wanted to, a couple of them wanted to drop out of college, one of my daughters wanted to drop out of college and go out and sing, and just because I went to college and uh, went all through a PhD and all of that, that, that. And I said to her, if this is your calling and this is what you want to do and you don't want to study music theory and you don't want to have other people telling you how to sing, you want to go out and sing, then sing. You know, you don't, you don't have to go to school, you know, to please me. I have a son who, whose dharma, he's four, when he was four years old, we handed him a surfboard. And um, he went out in front of where, you know, this place that I have on, on Maui, on Kanapali Beach, and he took, he paddled out on this surf. He was four years old, okay? And he went out all the way out, and he, stu he stood up on that surfboard, and he rode that surfboard in like he had been surfing his entire life. And today he's 23 years old, and every morning he gets up and he checks the, the wave patterns all over the planet. Uh, and I watch him when he's out there on the beach, he does this skimming, you know, we would take this board out there and, or, or when he goes surfing, and he studies the wave and he becomes a part of it. And I watch, I mean, he's like a cat, you know, pouncing on a, you know, on a, a, you know on going after a squirrel or going after a mouse. I mean, he's just waiting for the right moment. It's his dharma. It's just like there's something in him about surfing. He's gone to Indonesia. He goes down to uh, Central America. Uh, whenever he gets a, a week off, if he can, saves up his money, and the only thing he wants to do is just go down there and find the perfect wave and all of that. And it's like, and he says, well, Dad, what if I don't get a job doing this or doing that? He said, I, I just want to surf. I said, well, you can turn surfing into, you can become a surfing instructor, you can start a surfing business, you can design surfboards, you can, there's a thousand things you can do with surfing and, uh, and, but live your dharma, fulfill yourself. This is what I say to, to all of my children. I don't live my life through my children. You know, I don't own them. I, don't, I think loving without ownership is not only the great lesson of how to be you know, an effective parent, but it's how to be an effective partner you know, as well you know, in your relationships, is to love someone for what they are. Robert Frost said it better than anyone. We love the things we love for what they are not for what they can do for me, not for what they used to be, not for what they ought to be. We love the things we love for what they are. You know, we don't look at a little dog and say, you know, if you were only a cat, you know, I'd just love you so much more. If you only didn't slobber all of you. You love your dog for what it is. You love your tree for what it is. You love the sky for what it is. And you love your children for what they are. 
that's the kind of father I have become. And I really can trace that back to that moment when I finally said to my father, I can love you for what you are and what you were, even if what you were wasn't uh, what I would choose. You still were my greatest teacher, you know. And I know that when I leave this world, I know that he'll be there, you know. And uh, and I will thank him for for leaving, and I will thank him for uh, for all of the things that he did to help me to realize that we love the things we are and the people for, for what they are. And I can say to him, I, you know, I love you even though you didn't behave the way that I would want you to. And I've tried to get that idea across to my mother, but um, she often says, you just weren't married to him. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you did in the, in the film with this was really great. And I, I, it was my favorite part of the movie. And it was when he was giving the talk about the, um, uh, about the snake bite. It's not the bite. It's not the things that my father did. It's the venom that continues to pour through you, you know, long after, long after the bite. And, and, and I think you, that, that was, you know, he, he, Patrick did a great job in that. And that's, that's a talk that I've given many, many, many times, is that forgiveness is something that you do because it frees you. You know, that whole thing I, I saw in the bar, they were talking about, you know, wh whether this statement about um, whether it came from the Tao or whether it came from, uh, you know, that if the, the old Chinese proverb, and there's never a new Chinese proverb, they're all ancient ones. Right? Uh, and the ancient Chinese, if, if you're going to pursue revenge, um, you'd better dig two graves, you know, because you, you're going to kill the person that hurt you, but you're going to kill yourself in the process as well. So forgiveness is really about just replacing hatred with love. And when, and when you have that inside of you, and that's all that you have to give away, that's what the great spiritual masters teach us. That's who Jesus was. That's who Buddha was. That's who the, the, all of the great saints, that's who Sai Baba was, that's who Muktananda was, all of the people that I have revered, Nisargadatta. That what they've all taught us is uh, uh, be love. Just find, find love within yourself and just give that. Even, you know, I can remember a story I t I t I've told of a woman whose, uh, whose um, daughter was uh, murdered and her, uh, the killer was on death row. And we had talked and she was a client of mine, a patient of mine. Um, and she, she just couldn't get over it. She just c c couldn't get over this idea that this man um, he was on death row in California, which meant he wasn't going to be executed. He was going to live there until he died because they weren't executing people. And we talked and talked and talked about it, and, and, and she finally decided that she was going to go to, the, uh, go to death row and she was going to meet with him and, 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 and forgive him. And she said uh, she went there and she talked to this man, and, uh, and it was like she walked away from there and was able to sleep for the first time. Without, without, the, without the rage. It doesn't excuse it. It doesn't say that, you know, that he should now be freed and just walk about. If you take someone else's life, you, you, you don't get the privilege of walking around, uh, you know, um, in freedom. But it gave her the freedom, you know, and she was, she was free from it. And it was like, you know, if you look at, you know, if you look at the basis of just like Christianity, you know, on Golgotha, there is Jesus, you know, being crucified, and, and next to him are, t you know, t two uh, thieves, and um, you know, as someone throws a spear into his body, and he is uh, even more tortured. His words are, "Forgive them, for they know not what they do." And, and what I interpret that to mean is they don't understand that when they throw a spear into me, they're. They're throwing a spear into themselves and everyone else as well. That every act of, of hatred and bitterness is, is, um, is a desecration of, uh, of, the, of the God force within each and every one of us. You know? and the, the Dalai Lama once said that if we could take every child on this planet at the age of five and just have them meditate for one hour a week on compassion, 
we could end violence on this planet in one generation. One generation. Just teaching the children to think compassion, to think love instead of revenge, instead of hatred. Um, that's, and that's where, I, that's where I come from in my life. And I feel that way when people are celebrating the death, for example, when Osama bin Laden was uh, executed and thrown in and there were people celebrating all over. I wasn't celebrating. I said to, I said to my children, and they were happy about it and everything, I said, this isn't a happy moment for me. This is still an indication that we have so, so much farther to go uh, that we don't understand that we are all in this thing together. And instead of celebrating, you know, the killing of someone else, um, in the Tao it teaches us that, uh, you know, that you, ce you, you celebrate a, a victory in war um, by mourning because all of us um, have got to figure out a way to live together in peace and harmony. And every time there's an act that isn't that way, we should be mourning instead of celebrating. It's the way I look at it. I think it's, it's one of the great lessons of life, to have love inside of you. And, um, and we do it. We do this forgiving act to make ourselves holier. <laughs> That's the way I look at it.